about the history of the town of Surprise, we're proud to introduce to you Mr. Mark Dolan. How's this mic sound? Do we need to bump it up or do I need to talk a little closer? Okay, I got to swallow the mic. That's okay. We'll make it work. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, as you know, my name is Mark Doling. I know quite a few of you. And um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, back in the school days, I was the quiet, shy one that sat in the corner with his nose in the book. And if, if you believe that, we need to talk about some uh, river or lakefront property in downtown Surprise. And I'll explain that a little later in the program. Anyway, how I ended up here in Butler County, uh, my great great grandfather and my grandfather got tired of fighting the war for the Kaiser in Germany back in the 1800s. So they decided that they were coming to America. They landed in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I don't know via how they got there, but that's the earliest that I've been able to find. And they ended up in Bruno. And my great great grandfather actually walked to Wahoo. He was a grist miller operator, flour miller by trade. So he worked in Wahoo, and went back to the farm southeast of Bruno, and would stay there all week and then come to farm chores. So uh, I've actually have a set of great great grandparents buried south of Bruno in the Gunther Fricky Cemetery, about a mile and a half south on the East Side Road. So that was our original uh, location. Well, somehow, some way, my great grandfather and grandfather ended up in Surprise. So we've been there ever since. My grandfather Walt was born in 1901, and my dad was born in 1928. I didn't show up until 1960, so I'm a at this deal. <laughs> There's my dad, uh, granddad, grandmother, and uh, a lady that I have no clue. So note to self, right on the back of your pictures. So three generations back, whatever. You can see the old post office in the back, and uh, the building used to be a Runyon store, and I think uh, uh, Several other, uh, in New York, I think, had a, a bar in there back in the day. So, uh, before I really get going, I got to thank Jane Glock and uh, Alan and Don Laird. And um, I talked to Paul Ratchet on a couple different things. And um, my uh, ancestors were uh, being collectors. My wife says I'm a pack rat or a uh, hoarder, but it kind of runs the family. So,. <laughs> But that's where a lot of this stuff came from. So uh, that's that crew there. Now that's where I learned a lot of my stuff. Growing up, I was a half block from the front of the station. Well, there you had uh, Frank Flansburg, Jim Will. Jim Will's great-grandfather homesteaded east of Surprise in a dugout. So there's a lot of history there. Uh, Smokey Moore, uh, Frank Flansburg, and my granddad. And you can see in back of my granddad, that was the old Crumbless garage that was south of the Masonic Lodge over there. So pictures tell a good story. But you had uh, Jim Kropenhoff and Freddie Forney and uh, Omer Bomey and Harold Armagest and, uh, you know, just on and on, all the town folk that everybody has a story because they all grew up there. So that helped me out a lot. Plus. Dad wrote a book, and if anybody's interested in surprise history, we got some copies of the book that Dad had. We've also got copies of the cemeteries of Reed Township that uh, uh, Jerry Aldhouse and uh, Dick Ludden put together, and they did a lot of research, and they're very interesting about the history. Because back then, when they did obituaries, they wrote a life story. They didn't have a few lines. So it's really a lot of good information in there. Okay, this is what Reed Township looked in 1885. Um, Abram Towner in the red dot is where he settled from Ulysses, because Surprise is actually a suburb of Ulysses. Ulysses was there approximately 15 <laughs> years earlier. So they wanted to get out of the poverty ridden town and move out west to the new territory. <laughs> so David Reed, he actually was a cattle rancher around Brainerd. And he went to Ulysses, and then he decided to find a new place. And he's the green up there by that number four. 
Well, number four is what they call Cottonwood School. And then W.C. Will, uh, his dugout was along the Blue River, right there on the place where uh, John, <clears throat> excuse me, John and Norma Jean Peters lived and where my dad was born and uh, grew up. And uh, uh, now Tom Glenn Vidichka uh, lived there. And the red dot where Ibram Towner is between David Sonia Rezicek and Tom Glenn Vidichka. So that kind of gives you an idea where it was uh, in that. But you look at the schools, there are four schools. There were number four, number 40, 45, and 27, and 47. Number four is what they called the Cottonwood School, and that was in uh, 1869. That was a porch school in the county that was established. So they thought that that was pretty impressive that they uh, did that back in the day. <coughs> uh, the number 27 and number 25 is kind of interesting <coughs> because 27 was founded in 1871 and uh, number 45 was in 1872. They were a mile apart, so either neighbors couldn't get along or who knows what. <laughs> but 27 then disappeared and it was just 45. So uh, number four is the Cottonwood School was its nickname. And number 40 in the little left corner called New Year's School because that was the ground that the family gave to it and there were a lot of New Year's in that area. Number 45 actually moved north a mile and it was right south of Waldo Auto, so they called that one the Auto School. Number 47 up there, of course, they called the Towner School, and that was because it was near a group Towner. Well, later on, they moved it to the road east, and it was about a, a half or three quarter mile north, and it became the, uh, and I talked to Paula Ratchy, she went there all through grade school and said it was the Seminole School is what they nicknamed it. So that's a little bit of history there. And you'll notice uh, the Bethesda Church and Cemetery up there. The Bethesda Church was a Baptist church up on top of the hill by the cemetery that still exists. It's a Blue Valley Cemetery. It was never affiliated with the church. It was strictly a cemetery. So it's still the same group running it today as it was back then. There's the original log cabin that now sits north of the Historical Society. That's a picture of when it stood in Ulysses. They moved it from its original location to Ulysses during the 1967 centennial and later transferred it to David City. So uh, Ellie Towner Will, uh, and that's another story we'll get to, but uh, she was the granddaughter of uh, Abram Towner, and she says that was a log house. It was not a log cabin. <laughs> and she was emphatic about that. Okay, there's the first two pieces in the count or in the town of Surprise. Um, George Miller decided to leave his business in Ulysses, where he was a miller there and helped establish the mill uh, in, on the balloon Ulysses. And he said, come upstream, and they said, you're crazy, you'll never have enough water to do it. Well, they were surprised when he did. Or they were surprised to find a mill on the middle of nowhere because there was nothing there. The second building is a white building in the upper left-hand corner, two-story building. It's called Wilson's Hall. That was the first real commercial building. There may have been a few shacks, but that was the first building built in uh, uh, 1883, there was actually a commercial building in the Village of Surprise. If you look in the middle there, that's all just stuff from later on. Uh, in the middle of the picture, you can see a big uh, building with a uh, uh, chimney on top, it looks like. And that was actually an ice house in back of B.G. Chapman's store. So that was a little later on. Okay, now we're moving up to 1889. And one thing I did forget to mention, thank you to the Rushka Library and all the folks at the Boston uh, pro uh, Picture Project that helped me out and, and reframe this stuff and gave me access to the maps that I was able to pull up. And thank you to the historical side people for making this happen. So, uh, but if you notice this, this is in 1889. Now we've got two churches. We've got Bethesda up there where the cemetery is, and down below we have a, 
Methodist church called Pleasant Lawn out in the middle of the country. So schools and churches were very important to the settlers in Reed Township. And you'll notice a big thing that happened. It was a game changer. The railroad showed up. Now, Surprise was lucky that they didn't have to move. They were right on the line. They, they surveyed it and put it right through town. So that was a, a game changer as far as the village was concerned. Okay, there's a picture of the plat map that's Surprise. And if you notice all the little, uh, whoops, go away. I got fed fingers, I apologize. If you notice the uh, lots right there are all business lots. Well, they never became business. All the business was right along Center Street and right along Miller Street there. And that's where uh, the town basically had for its business center. If you look at that orange dot right there, that one, that is the windmill on the railroad that filled the water tower. They had a uh, water tower, uh, windmill and uh, depot and freight house right there on the west side of the tracks. And then Center Street where the red dot is, that's a corner right out in front of the uh, southeast of the Eagle's Nest to put things in perspective. And if you go to the top of the map, you can see the school's up there and uh, the mill is down here and the runway and there's the uh, Baptist Church down there and then green slits uh, that house that was clear in the west part, that's their place. Uh, the other thing that was noted in surprise was there were the stockyards and they had two elevators. There was a south elevator and a north elevator. So they were a pretty big grain and, and cattle uh, point of shipping on the Chicago North, or Fremont, Elkhorn, and Missouri Valley later to become the Chicago Northwestern. And, uh, if you look down here, you can see the dam right there. That was the original dam for the, the mill. If you stand on the bridge and look east, you can still see some of the concrete foundations from that on the, uh, in the river. So, uh, and the other thing you'll notice is green slits on a lot of the ground around the area. They came from Connecticut and back east and they were well funded. They weren't having to Live, live a hard scrabble life like the uh, average guy trying to better himself. They, they had a good head start and they ran the lumber year for over 50 years. Um, and the other one were the Judd family and they had a pretty, were pretty established so that helped that out. But uh, uh, the Greensons actually applied the town 1883 but they never got around to forming a county or a town board until 1902. Okay, you can tell that's a pretty nice house. When you own the lumberyard, that does wonders. <laughs> so, uh, like I say, that quit in 1940, but growing up, that was just west of town, and we used to have a, uh, uh, what we called Otto Spastry, because they run that, and we would have a field day out there. And that house was abandoned. It was a beautiful house, but they eventually burned it down. Okay, there's the uh, railroad. A little bit of significance for me. This engine, Dad and I actually rode in uh, Wisconsin. We got a cab ride, so we're pretty lucky. That's one of my other bad hobbies besides history is steam engines, steam locomotives, railroad. Uh, Jim can relate to that. Uh, anyway, they came down in 1887. That is an exact type of locomotive that ran on that line and through Bruno, Abbey, Linwood, uh, Brainerd, Dwight, in that area. Okay, this is on the west side of the tracks. You can see the windmill up there where that first picture was taken from looking west. So if you stand in the uh, corner of the intersection by the Eagle's Nest and look straight east, you would see that windmill and that uh, water tower there. So that's right west down Center Street. There's a north elevator on the east side of the tracks and the south elevator also on the east side of the tracks. North of the water tower is the depot and the freight house. And there's a picture of the Spice Depot. I know what Grandma's doing past the time, but hey, it was a nice, sunshiny day. Okay, the steel bridge. That was a big help because everybody had to ford a river, or had a rickety bridge. Well, this is a very substantial bridge. It lasts until 1969. 
So that was another way of funneling revenue and traffic to Surprise. If you look up the hill there, uh, you can see the steeple from the Methodist Church right there, and then the two-story building is Wilson Hall. The house to the right was George Miller, who had the, the grist mill, but the community hall was built in 1913, the brick structure, or the cement structure that's still there. Now, my granddad said when they were kids, when the dam was there, they used to dive off the bridge down in the water, and you see, you can see the water is all nice and clear with the sand bottom. I wouldn't want to do that now. You'd probably get stuck. <laughs> but uh, uh, just like, say, talk about family collectors, uh, the builder's plates up on there, I've got one of them in the shop at home, so if you ever want to come see it, I'll be allowed to show it to you. Also, I have the uh, spry side off the depot, so uh, sorry, Deb. <laughs> okay, there's a picture of the dam uh, for the uh, mill looking west towards the bridge, so um, that was a, a big help, uh, you know, economically to have that. Okay, this is the Baptist church that used to be up on the hill. Well, evidently, the folks in Surprise got tired of walking uh, up to the cemetery, so they moved that to the south side of town, right on south of the bridge on the west side of the road. So that's where the uh, Baptist church was. And I'm sure it got wet once or twice when it rained, knowing that part of the area. There's the Blue Valley Cemetery. Uh, it was established in 1880. Uh, the board paid 65 bucks for three and a half acres. So, you know, comparing to apples to oranges, it seems like it's been, but back then that probably was a lot of money. Uh, the Greensill family, uh, Walter Greensill was on the original board that formed the cemetery and his descendants still support the cemetery to this day. So we'll say thank you to them because they've got a whole bunch of their relatives buried there. In fact, we just buried the last one of the original brothers and sisters about a year or so ago, I think. <clears throat> That's what it looked like on Memorial Day of 2022. So I actually caught a nice breeze of wind and got the flag to kind of stand straight out. Okay, there's a Lutheran church that was uh, built in 1887. It was a block north and block west of the Eagle's Nest. <laughs> And uh, so all the Protestant religions were represented, but no Catholics. There's a Methodist church built in 1888, the last service since 1976, and the church bell lives on the Columbus Bell Tower. Uh, the bell, what happened after the church closed, the city uh, had an auction, and uh, uh, rather than let it go to uh, pieces just sitting there. They actually sold it out. And Leonard Fleischer, Fleischer Manufacturing Buffalo Cultivators, had a bell collection. And he donated them all for the bell tower display on the south end of Columbus on the entrance of Pawnee Park. So you can go up and read that. Here's the, the, uh, the uh, identification they've gotten under each bell and where it came from. So it's kind of a neat little uh, piece of history for surprise in the Methodist Church. Now, we got this bell from Old Dunker, and he lived just southwest of Surprise. And his son, Wayne, gave it to us. He always said it came from the Surprise Methodist Church. Well, the bell that's down in the park in uh, Columbus was 1889. So we don't know if that bell was in the church in Surprise before they put the big bell in, or whether it came from Pleasant Lawn, south of town. He donate the party farm, we fixed it up, so we got something to ring on the 4th of July, so. Okay, St. Peter's Lutheran uh, was built one mile north and a mile and a half east on the north side. Uh, it's believed it closed in 1919. There's still graves in the cemetery, and it's kind of semi-abandoned, but Gene uh, uh, can tell you stories about witch and graves there. That's a whole other story for a different time. Uh, and uh, the Methodist Church down south of town, Pleasant Lawn Methodist Church, uh, it was three miles south, and it operated from the 1880s until 1914. So don't know what became of the building. So their retownship was big on churches and schools. 
Now there's a surprise school district. So after the railroad came in 1887, we got a Methodist church in town, we got a brand new school, we got a brand new bridge. That place was rocking and rolling. It was a gold place. <laughs> you can see the original school was just kind of long or narrow. And then I think when they added high school, they added on the other edition. I really don't have a lot of history I was able to find on that, but pictures tell the story. Something happened that they added on. I don't know, Mr. Kapitka, did you ever teach in that school? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mark will tell a story about you before the end. <laughs> Put it this way, we're not going to discuss red paint on Hawaii 92 tonight. It's a whole different story. <laughs> oh, there's a school they built in 1922, which is pretty uptown. It had a gym, it had showers for the athletes, and that was pretty uptown in its day. So, and it's still there as a private residence right now. Okay, there's Main Street. That building on the right over here is Wilson's Hall. And I never put a dot, whoops, sorry. Uh, right at the end of the block is the corner that's by the Eagle's Nest. So you're standing in front of the concrete community hall looking north. And that was the line of uh, building. So when the railroad came through in 1887, they moved the post office out of uh, Cottonwood and actually moved it into Surprise. And uh, uh, that was a third building to the north. But what actually happened with the mail before Surprise came in, uh, a buckboard and a team of horses were used to carry the mail. And it was Thea Gill, uh, grandfather Dale Gill and Hastings, and Dale said that uh, he actually ran, I'm going to cheat here and read, uh, he would first pick up the mail at the railroad depot in Rising City. His first stop was Union School west of Rising City, then Greenleaf School, then Cottonwood School two miles west of Surprise, then on to Hackberry School and on to Wayland and then to Arborville, which is between Polk and, and uh, Hordeville, and then on to Hordeville and then on Central City, the Union Pacific Depot. It would take his grandfather's two days to make the route, and he always stayed overnight at the William Coon home just west of Hackberry School. It's where he met his uh, future wife by the name of Lulu McCoon, who became this guy, Dale's grandmother. So, uh, you know, you take a two day trip to uh, Central City and turn around and do it back, especially in the winter time, that'd get to be a long old trip. So, that's how they moved mail back in the old days. A lot of those. Uh, stops were actually schools. They didn't have a post office in the house. They dropped the school, whoever the quote postmaster was, and out of Cottonwood they had several. Uh, finally the A.H. Uh, Trowbridge, um, he was uh, the longest one for several years before it moved to Surprise. They would go to the school, sort the mail out, send the mail home with the students that had mail for their folks, and then he would take the rest home and make arrangements, they'd either ride over or whatever. So the schoolhouses were the drop point for the mail, and it was doled out, however, after that. So, uh, you know, that's why Cottonwood kind of Post Office there way before Surprise was. Okay, first post office is two buildings to the south of the Kafka's drugstore. And I told Jane Glock when I visited with her at, at her uh, place, just asked the question about surprise, she's got a ruler from that drugstore, so who knows how old that was. I'd like to have that Indian motorcycle up there because that'd be worth a fortune right now. You can see in the end of the walk down there is Wilson's Hall. So that's, that's kind of, you're looking at the business district right there. And the one at the trees in front of it, that's B.G. Chapman. And he was kind of a, a wheeler dealer, and, and uh, I'll get into his business a little bit later. That's the old post office that uh, Ethel Scoville ran for years. That was right east of the uh, Doling Oil shop building there. And uh, uh, we tore down probably in the mid 80s, something like that, it had fallen apart, but that was the old original one. And there was the uh, post office uh, at, before that time, uh, Dr. Ed Miller was there and the telephone office, Price Telephone Company moved down. 
It was originally uh, up on the hill where Larry and Carolyn Posvich lived in the house, and then it moved down here. And then later, I knew Boslowski bought it, and that was the post office for surprise for several years. And there's the uh, Sylvester home. That's where Larry and Carol Posvich lived. It's up on top. You see the big cable going up there. Those weren't power lines. They were telephone lines and had the switchboard, and you'd pull the cables and punch it. That was the uh, way you did it. And surprise, never got rid of party lines until 1982. They got a new switch that they actually, I remember, oh, Herman Hansen and Roger Colbert and all the guys from LTNT would go in that little shed and they file all the points on the clickers that used to go when you dial with the rotary phone. And uh, so I finally got replaced. And that house still stands. Okay, that's a hotel. Uh, that is. Uh, right east of the current fire hall, uh, just across Kitty Corner from the old Dolling Oil shop. And that was torn down in 1920. So Green Slits were very good promoters for the town. They did a lot for it. And that's Billy Welch's blacksmith shop, built around 1900. So uh, that was about a block and a half east of the Dolling Oil shop. So they had all of the, the good stuff as far as business goes. There's a Masonic Hall, uh, 1945 tornado took out the tree in front and it was inscribed for years, Cyclone, July 4th, 1945. <laughs> There's a bank building that was the first uh, original brick building, uh, built in surprise. You can see the old bank building off to the left uh, with the sign up there and then the general merchandise store right north of it. So. Uh, that later on became a cooperative credit association later on. And there's uh, directly east of the Eagle's Nest uh, where Bill White and George Gill, uh, one had the creamy, the other had a butcher shop, and there's another building to the east that was at New Year's Bar. Here's P.G. Chapman. You can look at the blocking around the trees to keep the horses from eating the bark off the trees while they're tied up doing their shopping. And the biggest thing that they noticed uh, that was told about BG's store was uh, it wouldn't exactly pass a USDA inspection. Uh, they said there were cats all over and the cats were there because there were mice. So you had to watch what you were, you were picking up and grabbing because you didn't know what it might be. But uh, he, he would uh, sell anything. He had an ice house out back, so in the wintertime they'd cut ice and uh, store back there. And there's one of the wagons hauling ice. Blue River with a uh, uh, dam like that, it was set up perfect for him to, to do that. So they'd take it, dig a big hole underground and stack it in there and put straw and sawdust over it to keep it from melting during the, the winter. Okay, Sprice had several newspapers, Sprice Herald, Sprice Citizen, Enterprise Booster Times, and then the Booster again. And Nolan Tomic had a weekly one-page newspaper called the Sprice Gazette from May of 95 to November of 97. So that was really neat to go through that because he had a lot of interesting articles. There's a community hall built in 1913. Like I say, Around the turn of the century, going into the 20s, this was a good place to be as far as something to do, because they had plays, movies, dances, and basketball games probably before they built the school in 22. Uh, the last regular usage of the hall was by the Blue River Square Dance Club uh, in the 70s, so I know Alan and Don did that once or twice in their <laughs> time. Okay, Green Cell number, Unfortunately, somewhere and never really got the family. Uh, they don't have any pictures of it. It was located a uh, half block east of the Doling Oil Building, where the township Quonset sits now, and that's where it was. And they closed in 1940. So we did have a, a little flyer there with uh, a bunch of the uh, kind of runs and run. Runyon's had a grocery store. I don't know, Joe Place or. Uh, Ari Francis or and Keebler had the drugstore, Jones Station, you know, Crumbless. So, you know, just old time names. A lot of business has changed hands through the years. 
Okay, 1909, George Miller got a water power generator in his mill to provide electricity to the town. It was changed to an engine driven generator in 1919. So, you know, you look at, you got all these businesses, you actually had electricity, which a lot of farms never got electricity until the late 40s. So, that's pretty cool. Village Surprise, really, uh, high point was around 1900. It had a high, uh, total population of 348 people. So, Okay, in the Davis City Tribune in 1887 had an article titled A Brief Sketch of Butler Place Railroad Town. And these are the businesses at that time. So you had the Dr. Uh, Wilson, Homer Rood had a wagon and repair shop, R.W. Morrison was a blacksmith, C.E. Wilcox, a hardware, William Highly Druggist, J. E. Wilson, James Morrison, and Myron Payne had general merchandise, Walter Greenslet had the lumber yard. G. E. Verity had the livery stable, and Fred Straub was a contractor, and C. C. Hartson had an elevator. So they just built the railroad, and they built an elevator right now. So they knew the business would, would come. Okay, and 13 Surprise was starting to uh, uh, prosper. They were rocking and rolling. And a group of men were looking at a way to promote Surprise and met with the representative of the Jones Chautauqua Company. For those of you that don't know, Chautauqua started out in Chautauqua, New York, as a lake by that name, where I believe as a Methodist minister used it as a camp or a meeting place to train Sunday school teachers, church workers, and that. And it became uh, more of a religious revival, and then it kind of evolved into a full entertainment uh, scenario. So. It was basically a traveling show one way or another. And uh, so the Chautauqua was usually, Davis City had one, and I think York and several other places. And they said, well, you're not big enough to do that. Well, prove them wrong. They did. They had Dr. Ed Miller, Reverend Yost, H. E. Wall, Warren Sisty, Homer Phelps, C.J. Johnson, Bill Wetmore, Fred Wrights, and Joe Poe. They said, we're gonna make this happen. So they didn't know where they were going to have it. They talked to George Miller, who owned the land. He actually owned a big chunk of land where the river was and where the mill was. And he says, yeah, I'll cut you, you know, I'll let you use it and we'll see what happens. Well, everybody pitched in, you know, the pioneer spirit, volunteerism, it all happened. So it was a hog lot. They cleaned it all up, plowed it up, and, uh, it was all volunteer, so it was all, you know, we want to make the community better. And that was one of the first years, because you can see the wooden bridge up there, which was later uh, changed to concrete bridges. And, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it's getting there. That's one of the years, if you look at right by the tree up there, that's one of those concrete bridges that's about two foot under silt right now that's all silted in. You could actually take a boat underneath there. You're standing on kind of the northwest corner in that driveway that comes in from the bridge looking southeast. The tent over there is actually where the tractor pull track was. And that's what the park looked like after we're, you know, after they had some, they had a lot of beautiful flowers. You can see the, uh, uh, mill in the back uh, of that picture. And there's another picture of the bridge uh, uh, across there in the uh, uh, 1888 bridge over the river. So they put a lot of work in that, and it was really a beautiful place. The Chautauqua ran from 1913 to 31, according to Lincoln Daily Star. And I got a credit, Gina, for this. She found this in the newspapers of the county, so I stole it from her. But they said an estimated 3,000 people coming in 500 cars and the railroad ran special passenger trains for the event. People rented rooms and pitched tents. This tent was located where the tractor pull tra uh, track is now. So you got a five pole tent. That's a pretty big deal in this town of not quite 400 people. <coughs> Okay, that was an original program from one of those Chautauquas. 
So you take Surprise Nebraska in August for five days and you're camped in a tent? That Blue River water sure felt good. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. And plus feeding all those people. So uh, that was a good, you know, uh, a big deal. And uh, part of the issue, that, or not issue, but part of the uh, deal of being in a program like that the people that did their program on the first day didn't stick around for the rest of them. They had another tent, they set up another town, they would send the people on the first day on the road, the second day, and the third day. So it was just kind of a rotation, and that way they could keep moving and put more shows in. They wouldn't bring the troops all at once. So um, I thought this was too interesting. I had to print the whole thing off. So. I don't know what kind of pastor this guy was in the church in Kansas City, but when you're viral, magnetic, pungent, powerful, or fearless, I mean, that must have been a really <laughs> brimstone kind of guy. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe he's a chocolate and forgot to take a shower. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had lectures. So when you're looking at uh, no outside news, these were like, you know, quite the event, so they traveled from far and wide. And you had music, you had performances, you had acting, you know, they're from New York. Oh, wow, never heard of that place. So, you know, it really brought a lot of new information to the people. And there's another preacher and then a uh, uh, musical trio, so. And then the last night was a little bit of fun and games to have along with it. So that would have been a pretty good deal. Well, here it is, 1942, and uh, they just pulled the railroad up. It's World War II, and uh, they were building the Hastings Examination Depot down in Hastings. The Chicago Northwestern already applied for abandonment. They decided that they wanted the scrap iron from the uh, track more than they wanted the railroad. Well, what happened, and uh, a lot of missing over, they actually took the rails and relayed them at some of these ammunition plants like Mead and uh, Hastings and different areas. The hardware from the spikes and the tie plates were scrapped, but they actually reused the rails in these uh, facilities because everything is by train to the coast for uh, bombs and stuff like that. So if the railroad went out, well, there were no way to get rid of the grain, no way to haul cattle. Uh, you know, and farmers didn't have trucks like they did. So granddad had sold the farm and moved to town and bought the hardware store and the gas station and uh, had to get permission from the war board to uh, be able to buy this truck. It's a 1944 Chevy that has a six-cylinder engine. And dad said they used to take that transport trailer. It was 2,500 gallons you know, which is nothing this day and age, but with a six-cylinder Chevy and during the war, it was 45 miles an hour, and they would have to go to Superior, Nebraska, to the nearest terminal to get fuel. So, quite, quite a bit different than it is now. That's Granddad pumping gas. Uh, that's on Lou Boslowski's panel. You can see the post office sticker on the bumper. And if you look at the old Masonic building up there, you can see the cars around there. So that's probably the doors blanket chippers run the blue or rent. And so a little bit of history there. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's understandable. <laughs> anyway, getting back to our pioneer spirit, the community project was in 1953 to try and bring back the Chautauqua, <clears throat> Chautauqua Park in Surprise. Uh, leaders were uh, John A. Vic Deere and Dick Ludden. So they moved and got funds, I think $2,500 uh, or $2,000 to build a dam and, and come up with an idea to make this kind of back to the way it was. So they uh, got that all put together. And that was the original pour across the dam 
but it reads two thousand dollars of material labor was donated that gets back to that pioneer spirit that we're talking about all a lot of projects in surprise were all donated labor so uh, the dam is still there uh, the inscription rates a dream come true uh, in 1954 that was Lake Surprise. If you look in the top there, that's the community hall. So everything east of the dam uh, was all dozed out and scrapers, and I can't find the pictures, but got pictures of scrapers running around in there, uh, cleaned that out. So for a few years, there was a nice lake there. Well, unfortunately, silt and everything kind of filled it back up again. Okay, 1954, we have the four schools. Uh, top left is number four, uh, Cottonwood. That was out uh, west of town, uh, right north of Dan and Barbara Rasmussen's near uh, Palachik's. And uh, top right is District 47, which is the Towner School where it started out, but that ended up uh, uh, Oh, well, if you knew where Hecker's lived or, uh, oh, shucks. Anyway, it's a mile, uh, in, or two miles east and a half north of Surprise. And uh, Paul Arachi said they, they called that the Seminole School. Uh, lower left was the uh, uh, New Year School out to the southwest town. Bottom right is Auto School, which is located south of uh, Reed, uh, where Reed Otto lived and then where uh, Waldo lived probably at that time. And then the main school building, which was District 83, was uh, in the center. And they all voted, went together. And that's where the District 1 R came. Uh, district 1 and then the R for redistricting. So uh, that was back in the day. And due to the declining population of Surprise Street Township, the high school closed 1950. It actually went from, uh, they dropped 11th to 12th grade, and then in 52, they got rid of uh, uh, 9th and 10th. So it was just a grade school. And that closed in 2000. And I went through and looked at a plat map uh, from <coughs> the early 60s, I can't remember exactly counted the farm places. There were 112 farm places, and uh, in a comparison 2022, there were 52. So yeah, that's where all the people went to. Surprise High School had an alumni reunion uh, every year for every five years, and unfortunately they all passed on, and there's a few left. Uh, you know, but there was only a handful there, so they uh, gave it. That's a picture of the inside of the gym, and then that's when they were getting either cleaned up or ready for it. And, uh, you know, that was back when your grade school looked big, but now it, uh, yeah. not so much. <laughs> I still remember going to uh, Abby and playing in Abby's place in the gym there, so it was fun. We didn't know any different, didn't care. <laughs> That's first fire truck in Rising City. It was actually uh, uh, provided uh, uh, fire and EMS by Rising City Rural Fire District in the surrounding area. Uh, the rural board says, hey, if you guys put up your shed, they provide equipment down there. So we built the first truck uh, over in Dolan Oil Company. Alan remembers that truck. Well, as we grew a little bit and got uh, several more firefighters and took EMD class, we need more equipment so we do medical stuff and uh, go from there. So when we had the auction for the Methodist Church and they used the funds to erect a new fire station in 1982, uh, that enabled us to get a four-wheel drive grass rig and a 1,500-gallon uh, tanker truck and we built both of those in Dan Rasmussen's shop west of Surprise of Rasmussen Repair. Getting back to the Pioneer Spirit, we had the, or the town put up the money to buy the tools, but, uh, or I mean the uh, parts pieces to build it, but the volunteers stepped up to the plate again. Bill Potter, Martin Mortensen were from Rising City and 
Joe Rizdijak and Bill Peters were the resident carpenters around town and they helped put it together and Larry and Bob Pospichel were uh, running the uh, uh, pivot service up in uh, Rising City. So everybody helped out and got her built and it stood to this day. It even made it through one of the big deals that we had in surprise some years. Note to self, right in the back of the picture, they have no clue who those guys are. <laughs> <laughs> we know they're from the area and thanks for your service, guys. <laughs> now, we're in the process of building a new fire hall, Deja Vu, the original uh, church that allowed us to build the original fire hall is now the location of the new fire hall. So we're going to put some more equipment and uh, help provide uh, a uh, little uh, broader area for EMS service. So <coughs> you see blue repair off the left there. And that's what we're going to house down there. We've got the, the ambulance that's going to go down. Currently, we've got the 750 gallon minute pumper and the grass rig. So, uh, the Rising City as a whole, we got 38 members. And Reed Township, we've got nine firefighters, of which five are EMT. So, uh, we're pretty fortunate, as I say, the volunteer fire or the volunteer pioneer spirit shines again. One of the uh, big lucky deals, and it's bad that the fire happened, but it just so happened that one of the firefighters was hanging out in the shop that day with Gary, and uh, one of the guys was working on a tractor pull tractor, draining the gas out of it and arced a spark and lit up the fire. Well, I just had to be standing in there having a cold one with Gary on a Saturday afternoon. And by the time I ran down to the fire station and uh, got back up there, it was fully engulfed. So luckily we got the good knockdown and saved the building and we saved the office so we didn't lose any uh, business you know, information. But that's next day, 40 people showed up to help clean up. 60 people uh, showed up throughout the week to help. So we got it back and going in three weeks, which could have been a, a barn burner on the ground. So that lucked out. And like I say, the volunteerism showed through again. That's what 400 tons of hay looks like when it's on fire. It's located. Uh, mile and a half, or t almost two miles north of Surprise. So that was a hot one. Well, we got storms. Unfortunately, that happens. Uh, that storm, there wasn't anybody really injured in Surprise, but it did some damage. Uh, the Henderson family and the Uphoff family lost seven people. Uh, in 1945, if you look behind the bank up there, that used to be Dollander's grocery store, and it pretty well took that out. Uh, the tree that was in front of the Masonic Lodge right there, that's the one that got ripped out where they put the cycle on July 4th, 1945. So that was just a long time ago. This is more recent. Same thing. Took right through the town. It, nobody got hurt. Everybody was at football games on Friday night. Don DeRose Primus War Home, and luckily that saved, probably saved a life because that's uh, what some of the damage that was worth. This is a picture of the bar when uh, uh, Rizzi Chuck and Vidichka had it. They put a peaked roof on it and man, I see it up good. That's what it looked like after the tornado. It flipped that roof about uh, three quarters of a block east and uh, totally destroyed it. And, uh, the ceiling came down and it was just shot. Well. Luckily, Tom the Ditch got wild and decided we need a barn surprise. So he told the fireman, he says, you burn that down, I'll build a new bar. Well, that next weekend, that bar was on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> we did not stutter. <laughs> and that's a Donna Rose Primus, uh, what's left of the trailer, what was. It just shredded that thing, scattered it for a block. That was Jim Karpachek Jr.'s place northeast of town. It was in the fall in September. Yeah, it ruined a lot of crop. It just flattened it and tore up his barn out there. And volunteerism shows up again. Everybody from I don't know how far around came and uh, really helped. I mean, it was, it was amazing. In two days, we had that town pretty well cleaned up. 
And that's a new bar that was in place of the one that got tore up. Yeah, it snows in Nebraska. That was a long time ago. I forgot what that was. I had to dig for that one. Uh, that's just north of my house. You can see the, see the trees up there at the Blue Valley Cemetery on the hill. And uh, uh, that was a lot of snow. Those are the drifts. That's my daughter standing on top of the drifts. Thank goodness we didn't have any burials that year because I didn't think we'd got it done. And remember I said about that uh, uh, river for lakefront property in downtown Surprise? <laughs> Here you go, I'll set you up. June 2008, they had tons of rain. The actual Blue River starts over by uh, Marquette and Polk and in that area. And then it has Davis Creek that runs through Osceola. All comes through the little town of Surprise. Well, they got tons of rain over there and we we're watching it come and come and come. So. Needless to say, uh, if you look to the south in the back of that pickup, that hole uh, from the bridge almost to the south corner is running water on that day. day. So, guess what? We're saving the local watering hole. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble with surprise is when you're down the bottom, it does no good to sandbag around the house when the water comes up through the basement. So, it wasn't like we're ignoring them, but there just wasn't anything you could do. And so we kept it out of there for a while. If you look to the west, you can see all of the, the second lake out there. You know, it'd be nice if that was about 10 foot deep and you had lake houses around it and you'd water ski, but it wasn't quite that deep. Uh, David, Rizzi, Chuck, and Don Vidichka started uh, Arby's Bar and Grill uh, in the July 3rd street dance featuring Homegrown was born. So needless to say, there's a lot of stories about that, but that was a big part of Swiss history. I'd go to Lincoln and says, yeah, well, that's where they had the big dances. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Dave and Kathy Williams with the Poor House continued the tradition of Ted Wicker until 2006 when the, the tornado came through that fall, and that was the end of that story. So another thing we did, another volunteer deal, Jim Nurkaruka, and Delmar Ratchet went into antique tractor pulling. And with the town surprise, worked together to start the annual tractor pull in Chautauqua Park. There's plenty of room for parking, plenty of shade for spectators. So uh, basically, the track goes right through where the Chautauqua tent used to be. We did it for 20th years uh, until uh, 2016. So it was a lot of fun while it lasted, but everybody's getting old and tired and didn't want to do it anymore. So. <laughs> And there's Judy Hazy uh, talking to the folks and uh, uh, Alice Dimini and Sonia Rezicek, and that was the announcer stand. And there's a track full in the track. Guys really loved it because there was plenty of shade and plenty of room for parking and um, the good old days. I don't know that guy, but he wasn't doing too bad a job running the street for that day. <laughs> Back in the 50s, you could say surprise without a coyote hunt. Uh, they uh, had a bounty on coyotes for $2 for a pair of ear up at the county. And uh, needless to say, that encouraged folks to go out and get rid of them. Well, when they didn't have the uh, regular walk-in hunts or whatever, we turned to the air. Granddad had a J3 Piper Cub, and his cousin, Lil Nucker, was a B-17 pilot in World War II. And uh, anyway, he learned to fly originally on the J3 Cub. So Lowell would pilot the plane from the back, back seat, granddad's in the front, flip the doors open, and waylay the coyotes out through the window. And uh, I was talking to Bud Rudolph. He was a pilot in an airplane fishing auto. And he says, yeah, when I first came to David City, I heard there was a plane went down. And anyway, I guess somebody had shot and hit the prop with the shotgun and threw it out of bounds so they killed the engine and landed it. Well, to get it back, so they measured it off, took the shotgun, shot the other side, balanced it down, got to live back to where they were going. One, one time when I was, uh, I wasn't running the shotgun, but I was riding along with Lowell swatting coyotes, and this one coyote was pretty obstinate. Well, Lowell knew that plane pretty well. So we're in a milo field that nobody hardly knows what that is anymore. He took the front wheel down there and rolled that coyote with the front wheel of that plane and picked up and rolled out. 
talk about whoa. <laughs> but yeah, he made it look like nothing. He just boom and Kyle went to the road and they got him. So yeah, a whole different time. Now the money kisses and tree huggers would have you chained and thrown in jail. Carol Torty, really neat guy. He uh, uh, was a bachelor. He never got married because he was taking care of his mother in her old age. So I better speed up. I'm talking too long. Anyway, he uh, built this plane uh, back in the day. And uh, he, the town kids is always going out there. And he would teach us woodworking and special projects. So really wonderful guy and uh, uh, really good. And there's got to be something about the, the water and surprise because we had so many mechanics come out of that uh, Reed Township area. There was uh, George Vanis, George Yannock, Larry Vanis, uh, you know, Fred Forney, uh, Dan Rasmussen, Bernie Eichmeyer, Jamie and Drew Eichmeyer, myself, Doug Rezichek, you know, all a bunch of gearheads, and you'll see that in a little bit. So anyway, Harold never really did get to fly, but he uh, built the plane. And there's Freddie Forney, he had Fred's Motor Mart for years and years. And we were little kids, we'd go up to shop, and he had that uh, motorcycle sitting on the wall in boxes, parts, pieces. And he said, I'm going to get that fixed up someday. And boy, he sure did. <laughs> Beautiful bike. Well, another thing that all the gearheads and surprise, we had uh, all the mechanics, and then we had street riders. I didn't, wasn't able to get a picture, unfortunately, but we had the Pro Esca boys. There was Jim and Ray and Kenny and their cousins, Larry and Marv and Ronnie and Todd. They all had nice cars and, you know, car show type material. And they had the Rednecks elect a race. <laughs> Freddie had uh, the Seven of Hearts. That's Carol and her Tad, as she was known. And, uh, he also had seven of diamonds, and uh, that was an old Chrysler 225. Fred had everything, anything it had to be a Chrysler. There's Larry Sobota. He drove a 67 Chevelle. I hate to see how many Chevelles ended up in the scrapper because of us race guys. That's where I kind of got my first indication because we were like a block apart and here the engines start up, so guess where I went? <laughs> There's a couple of rednecks. Doug Rezichek, <laughs> our first uh, first effort. He was in Milford, and uh, well, we're both in Milford, and uh, put that car together. And uh, uh, I was a cool pit crew, but unfortunately, Doug uh, got tagged off a uh, corner three in David City, and uh, his seat belts came loose, and he broke a bunch of ribs. So. He was going to school in Milford, and we'd make him laugh and he'd start. <laughs> so we were mean, but that was good old days. I don't know, you might know that crew. Uh, that's back when I was driving, and Dan Rasmussen and Mike Foster, so they're the pit crew. You notice the plain label beer cans? Who's seen Falstaff cans for a long time? You know, when you're poor and broke racing, you don't get too particular about what you drink. <laughs> The, be the funny thing about it, though, both these pit guys <coughs> drove a mechanics race. Well, the other car before this one, Dan Rasmussen drove. Somebody in a souped-up, higher-class car came around, tagged him, pushed him over number three, and rolled it. <laughs> Snuffy was out doing hot laps and got a little too lead-footed, and he rolled it. So note to self, don't let your pit guys drive your car. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, uh, Dan had a Chevelle and we put it together and put a cage in it and, and drove it. It was kind of a community car and Steve Hopel drove that one too. That was one of my better nights uh, here at, Jerry, at uh, Dave State Speedway with Jerry Perlaska. Now I pity the poor gal. Here's some big, sweaty, stinky, <laughs> just grand, humpy, latch full of mud and oil and whatever, stand there with the arm around her and you, know, and you feel sorry for that poor gal. <laughs> Dave Resnick, he had a street stock. Jamie Eichmeyer had a stock car and a uh, IMC modified. And to keep the uh, race, racing thing going, Dana Rasmus currently racing, and that's Dan's son. So, like you say, there's some in the water down there about gearheads. Okay, 
Little National of Recognition Surprise. Prague Magazine uh, was a nationwide insert in Sunday papers. In 68, the Census Bureau and the Public Health Service said that 11 counties in southeast Nebraska uh, had the longest lifespan in the U.S., so it actually made national news. You see, that's a Rocky Mountain news. At that time, my uncle lived in Denver and sent it to us. So it hit the, the big time. Warren and Frank Flansburg were on the lead part of the story. No two better guys. I mean, had dry senses of humor and, and been around forever. Now, I put that in there because the young guy there goes to prove that I finally made the paper some, for something other than a moving violation in traffic court. <laughs> <laughs> so that was in the Drill Star uh, coinciding with the Parade magazine. So, And Class C State runner-up basketball team, they were the Butler County champs, uh, the district champs, and Class C runner-up in 1939. I don't know any of those guys. So Alan might know a few of them, but. And the other one that did good come from the small town, Quentin New York grew up and went to school in Surprise, went to high school in Centennial in Utica, graduated from there. Uh, Uncle Tom wanted to go walk on Nebraska, but he had a free ride to K-State, and so he took that. Uh, he was starting center for the Wildcats and played two seasons with the Baltimore Ravens and three at the Jacksonville Jaguars. So homeboy did good. <coughs> and the other thing that really happened uh, to change the area was uh, Butler County Dairy came into uh, Reed Township, two miles north of Surprise. It's the largest dairy in Nebraska. The facility contains 6,000 milk cows and contains 68,000 gallons of milk per day. They milk three times a day, 24 hours a day. So that place never shuts down. They're always rocking and rolling. <coughs> okay, this is the Veterans Honor Roll Mark at the Blue Valley Cemetery. I'm not going to read them all. I'm running out of time. I'm already over my limit. Um, and uh, uh, trying to think. Uh, I know Tom Vidichka was a veteran, Brian Littlefield. My brother was in the guard that currently lived in Reed Township. But, if I forget somebody or whatever, please forgive me because trying to put all this stuff into an hour program is really hard. And this is the honor roll uh, that hung in the Methodist Church and it is back there on the table for close luck. Uh, we had four soldiers in uh, World War II that uh, made the ultimate uh, sacrifice. Robert Reed Wustruck, uh, Raymond Doty, Francis Smith, and Floyd Nettleman. Um, so the other guys in World War II, uh, like say Lowell Dunker flew B-17s at the 8th Air Force. Uh, Wilsey Rasmussen flew B-29s in the Pacific. Uh, Warren Noble was a pilot. I know Harold Armagus was in the Army and got a Purple Heart. Uh, and I know there's more. Please forgive me. My dad is, he is uh, in the infantry World War II. Okay. Edgar Klein. Edgar Klein, thank you. And, uh, uh, like you say, nothing intentional, but I just couldn't get them all. <laughs> okay, what other surprises are out there? There are uh, six in the United States. There's Surprise Arizona, which is a town of 150,000 people. And Urban Legend says that Homer Ludden came from Surprise, Nebraska, went down there, married a gal, got some real estate, and they named it Surprise after Surprise, Nebraska. Well, <laughs> They're debating that now, but as far as we're concerned up here, yeah, Homer led name Surprise, Arizona. So we got Daryl Surprise in Nebraska, uh, Surprise Indiana, New York, Tennessee, and Virginia, and I think there was one in Missouri, but they're all wide spots on the road. There really isn't much to them. The one to British Columbia, I had to look at it, and all it is is a, a wheat field. Uh, and uh, they're the internet said there's one on the French island of Reunion in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I have no clue. I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, there's a bird's eye view surprise from the south. And uh, you can see the school up there. Uh, that, whoops, I got it. Sorry about that. Uh, Post Fishel's house is the 
two story up there. You know, I quit. I give up. Uh, the white building, the big white building, that's Wilson Hall. You can see the mill in the middle. The big white building to the east, that is the hotel. And the big, big V top building on the west, that's a Lutheran church. So uh, that's kind of my road trip through Surprise. We're going to get back in our DeLorean, turn it back to 2023, <laughs> and head off into the sunset. So <laughs> thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to put that. Just remember, we had a little change of venue because of the county fair. Brainerd will be June 5th and Garrison June 26th. So uh, I'll open up. Any questions that my people mind can come up with? Yes. I wonder why you went too quick over the ice building. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well. Well, uh, Eugene Glock asked, how come we never uh, uh, went in the ice a little more? Well, I'm over, already uh, almost 10 minutes over my hour allotment, so, you know, unfortunately, the mind can only absorb as much as your butt can endure, so I'm, I'm probably pushing that limit. Like I say, I apologize for going over. Uh, you know, it's so difficult, you know, that you just can't get everything you want to put together, so... I uh, tried to get caught up from Dad's book in 82 to a lot of the stuff that happened here in my lifetime. And uh, I wanted to put this program up there as a PowerPoint so when you go online and find it, you can take time and, and be able to look at the picture. So uh, very good. Anything else out there? Yes, Russ. Is Surprise still a U.S. Uh, weather station? Area. Yes. It still is. Yep. Uh, the uh, surprise, like I say, the Blue River starts out west on uh, near Marquette and Polk and Hortville and that area. Uh, we're the first river gauge on the Big Blue River. So if you always see a flood warning for surprise, we're the first river gauge. So that that's a reason for that. Yes. Yeah, if it, it was Arizona put that on. Yeah, uh, Kathy Urbanic said that there is a PBS said that Surprise Arizona was named for Surprise Nebraska, so maybe we're still in the mix. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? How did Surprise get its name? Surprise. Originally, uh, there were a couple of things, but it pretty much boiled down to the bill. As George Miller left the milling company in Ulysses, they said that they wouldn't be surprised either if you could make it up there or if you had enough water to run a mill that far upstream. So that's where Surprise Mill, if you look look at that 1885 uh, map, that was Surprise Mill was the name of the area at that time. Anything else? Yes. Surprise, Arizona at one time was the fastest growing town in the United States. They uh, <clears throat> are in like Sun City West and all those towns you hear about are in that part. They're in the northwest of, uh, part of Phoenix and uh, it's really a neat place. I mean, uh, I think what the Kansas City Royals have their training camp down there and a couple other ball teams in their winter league. So anything else? Yes, Russ. I promised I was going to tell you to tell a story about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take a look at the guy. He's a big guy. He never told about him being a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, he really didn't think too much about basketball because of his size. And I says, well, you can play. We'll put you underneath. And so he killed a few people. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to tone him down a little bit. But Mark did learn how to play basketball very well because of his height and size. 
and he really enjoyed it. So he was a basketball player. Doesn't look like one, but he wasn't. I have, I have to let her. Uh, Rest of picture was telling about some of my escapades back in basketball days. Uh, Grace wasn't exactly my number one forte. Uh, I got a little side story on that, though. We played a basketball tournament at St. Joe's in uh, York, the uh, Catholic school there, and we won the tournament. So I go to my duffel bag and pull out a big old hun knife, and we cut the nets down with that. No, no, I would probably get thrown in jail. <laughs> Yes. The Runyons that had a business in Surprise, did they go to Rising later? Or, because I know there was a business. Bill uh, Runyon had it in Rising. She, she was uh, asking whether the Runyon store went to Rising. I don't know. Do you know Alan or Vicki? I don't. I, I, I just know it was Lil Runyon at Rising. I don't know if it was the one and the same or not, but her. We'll talk about it in Rising City. Okay, we got that covered. So that means you got to go to Rising City. Anybody else? Yes. 1947, I went to school at Dwight Assumption High School. I was a freshman. When we played Surprise High School in that brick building in 1947. John Mirowski said that Dwight Assumption played Surprise Gym back in the good old days. That's far I come come around, but. Uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of, I mean, that was a big gym in its day, you know. Anybody else? Questions? You know, I'd like to thank all the folks from the Historical Society and the Rushka Library for making this happen. Uh, you know, gave us a chance to uh, tell some stories or whatever, but hi, if you want to talk about the red paint, I can do that later. <laughs> That's uptown. <laughs> I can also tell you that story. So. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark, for the presentation. It was fantastic. Here is a plaque giving you two years worth of uh, membership, which means you just have to work for us for two more years. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And I, <clears throat> I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, the first one was this. It will be at 6.30 and it will be here both times, so we hope to see you then. Um, take time to sign up at the library if you or at the table out back or call the library for the next one so we know how many chairs to set up or more importantly how many collages to bring. Um, if you would, throw a couple bucks in the donation box in the hallway on the way out. It helps pay for this event center and all of our other expenses. Um, let's, I'm going to thank the library for bringing the water and Cheryl Hine for manning the table out there and um, Mark for filming himself pretty much. Um, <laughs> Judy Davis and Richard Polachik back there running the um, calendar table as well as a few other people I see. Um, Gina for her hundreds of hours behind the scene that she does to make these work and mostly all of you for coming. Um, importantly, finally, Saturday, May 27th is our opening day at the museum. And we are open every Saturday, Sunday from one to four. And uh, from now through Labor Day, from Memorial Day through Labor Day. And we've got a really neat um, display set up. It's five tiers. It's got a pioneer living display. It's got a um, Native American display. It's got a railroad display. It's got an antique map display. And it's got, a, as always, a video of Butler County history. So take a couple hours out of your day and come see us over the weekend this summer. And we appreciate it. And drive safe on the way home. Thank you very much.